two white women after two white men. <laughs> In what follows, I wish to argue that the community formed by man and woman is the paradigm and seed of the political common good, as John Paul II says, that the new community formed on the basis of gender is the seed and paradigm of the political uncommon good. The first members of the human world are those who cannot exist without one another, the male and female, said Aristotle. These two are indispensable to each other. Each of them owe their very existence to the male and female, as their progeny will owe its existence to them. That is why they are now each good together. Genesis states it negatively. It is not good to be alone. Let us insist on a point. It is not just the togetherness of any two that is indispensable for the goodness of each. It is the togetherness of the two sexes that is good what Pierre Manon describes as that strange proximity of the most distant kind. It is the togetherness of two who have the same things, common things in an utterly uncommon manner. Chesterton speaks of incompatibility in this sense. I know of many happy marriages, but never a compatible one. A man and woman as such are incompatible. What is more, each individual is a complete instance of the same human nature, a substantial whole, and yet the wholeness is still incomplete. The single person lacks nothing but lacks everything, says Fabrice Hajjaj. The body bears this out. Each of the sexes has everything except for one thing, the generative power being a partial power. Thus, notwithstanding being whole individuals, they are also in some sense divided. The word sex itself means division. What is more, the part that each has and the other doesn't permeates the common everything that they do have, such that at no point does the common everything protrude neutrally beyond their uncommonness. Even more so thorough is the uncommonness, it appears to be the mode of being of the whole, such that the part is not only in the whole, permeating it, but the whole is in the part. Indeed, what we always see first when we see an individual human whole is a boy or a girl, a man or a woman. Everything that they have in common then is in what is partial and therefore in what one has and the other does not. In this sense, they are wholly relative. Each of the poles can only be, in the full sense, in relation to the distantly proximate. This is why they cannot exist without each other. They can only exist together not just next to each other. The situation of man and woman places at the very origin of human society a dizzying paradox. The whole relativity between man and woman is evident, of course, in the act specific to them. That act can only be done together. Unlike standing on one's two feet, walking, running, eating, and so on, all of which activities can be done alone, their act cannot be done but together. There are other human acts that can only be done together as well, like forming a city, going to war, having a conversation, holding a symposium, and contemplating, since one must always comp contemplate something else. But these all presuppose the act of the man and woman, the one that can only be done together, for one cannot be without coming forth from them. The situation of need for the other sex and of the other generation is not a poverty, it is a richness. It is the lowest animals and plants who need the other sex the least. They are the least sexually differentiated, being asexual, like bacteria, then hermaphroditic, like worms and barnacles. The same follows for the distinction between the generations. Among the lowest of animals, progeny are quasi-clones or reproductions of the adult, and they need the least amount of gestation or brood care. The division of the sexes between individuals and the conspicuous forms marking it, on the other hand, is a condition of animals with higher intelligence, visual acuity than, finally, rationality, and a greater world, a larger environment, eventually all things, omnia. Not surprisingly, the progeny of higher animals are in the greatest need of brood care, in the sense of the human, in, in the case of the human infant, the need is the greatest of all. Some speak of the human infant as being born a year too early and needing an extra uterine year in the social womb of the family, where it is exposed to the outside, 
the wide world, without which it will not develop its quintessentially human features, uprightness and speech. In short, life is progressively transcendent, and the division of the sexes, one being here, the other being there, and the greater need for and involvement with it is one of the primary marks of this. We can assume then that the greater dependence on what is not itself by virtue of not having everything is the other side of a richness. As Aquinas said, referring to the natural restlessness for God, it is a more noble thing to have a higher good that can only be attained with the help of a friend than to have one that can be attained alone. It is better, that is, to be fulfilled in the city in both the temporal and spiritual sense than to be a barnacle who needs next to nothing else to live well or to be good. But that begins, as Aristotle said, with the two who can only be good together, who, can, who cannot exist without each other. The reason that these two are called pre-political is that they provide the proper seed for the polis. The first and vital cell of society, as Catholic social de- teaching puts it, is such because it opens man up to what is both not himself, the distant, yet proximate, not alien. And it does so as it communicates speech, or logos, whereby the human being can can know reality in the same way man and woman know each other, both intimately, proximately, bringing the known into oneself, and as in itself, according to its distinct identity, so distantly. And together with all the other children of all the other families, since the mother tongue is also a common language. It is a sexual difference suffused with logos that makes the city possible, says Fabrice Hajaj. We should note here that the first and vital cell of society also provides the city with something to talk about. This is true not only because the mother and father are the first things known and spoken by the youngest citizens, but also because the basic cell provides a city with one of its greatest questions, something to be debated in its public squares and symposia, the most metaphysical and theological question of all, the one concerning the goodness of being, especially in its finite creaturely form, as this thing in this flesh. Fabrice Hajaj, who has brought together the two preconditions of the polis, perhaps unknown to Aristotle, the sexes and the logos, puts it bluntly, What good is it to keep filling up cemeteries? That's the question that sexual difference provokes. The natural openness within the family to what is distantly proximate is why the polis does not destroy the oikos when the oikos is introduced into it. The polis builds on nature. It does not destroy it. Yet these also mutually build or inform each other. The polis helps the oikos to be more itself, by keeping it from closing in on itself. For no human being can regulate by himself this distance or this proximity. Menon again. The polis demands the responsibility of the father, assuming the presumption of paternity, and thus opens the family up to the greater world, since the father is a sort of outsider. This keeps the family from being buried under the suffocating Oedipal sphere of imminence tied to the apron springs of the great mother. And the small mother, too. The polis also opens the family up to others through the prohibition of incest, both in the narrow sense and in the wider one of forbidding marriage with anyone remotely related to you, something Christianity emphasized even more. The ancient and ubiquitous practice of exogamy established a mutual openness between and among families contrary to Hobbes' reading of what families do. In short, one must both leave father and mother and one's own tribe. Open up in this way, the oikos now builds or informs the polis in its turn by being a cell not governed by the bellum omnium contra omnes. Indeed, quoting Manon again, laws about marriage and filiation form in some sense the original laws of the human world. And in this sense, they provide the initial ratio of law, to core, namely as rule and measure of action, especially as concerns the common good. There's much debate about the nature of the common good, other than the meaning of the two words taken singly, as we know. 
As David Crawford notes in his magisterial article, and I will channel him here, there is the low, member-directed sense where the common exists to provide or yeah, provide goods for the individual members, strictly speaking. It is not the common life or the goodness of being together that is good for the individual members, members per se. It is what the community makes available to individual members that is good. There is then the high sense where it is the goodness of the members that offer their goodness to the community or to the common in the way good employees make a company a good one. Neither of these two senses need to be dismissed, but what they both seem to lack in defining the common good is the coincidence of good and common. That is where the, it is the being together as such that is what is good. Naturally, that sense would incorporate the other non-coincident senses, for you need to have individual members for there to be a togetherness, and they need to be good for the togetherness to be good. But without these partial senses being integrated into the more comprehensive sense, of the common good. However, the risk is an instrumental view of either the common reality or of the good person, liberalism, collectivism, respectively. But in either case, the individual person is somewhat lost. This is fairly obvious in the second sense where the collectivity is emphasized. But it's also true even if less obvious in the first sense where the individuality is emphasized since if the individual is not already defined positively by his membership in the common reality, he must constantly negate his belonging to it in order to be himself and effectively negate himself. This has become ever more clear in the context of gender, as we will see. Here I take the common good in the highest sense where the, good, where the togetherness itself is good. It is good to be together. Let me list some of the most salient features, putting them in relation to the first and vital cell of the family. And I'm repeating some of what Dr. Hamby said, also perhaps channeling Michael Waldstein. One, a common thing is a single thing, a whole. It's not just the same kind of thing possessed by many, say the happiness of the greatest number. Rather, it would be the happiness of the one reality, the happiness of being together, and thus the happiness of being members of that one reality. In our case, it would be the happiness of the communion of life and love together with the external good that makes it happy in the greatest sense, who is also one as a communion. Two, the common good is communicable. It pours itself out, welcoming more members into the one reality of the community in the way that God is communicative in himself and then towards what he is not. It is clear how the community of man and woman pours itself out of its very nature through the act specific to it. And is so good, we add that, and it is so good, we add that it gives the new members a kind of genuine integrity, not just dangling them on a thread. Three, there is no diminishment of the good of the co of the communion when new members share in it as if in a pie, though perhaps the pie would be diminished at the family table. On the contrary, the good of the communion is amplified. We can think of how a child adds to the good of the togetherness not only quant quantitatively, there being more members of the community, but also qual qualitatively, for the child is the embodiment and confirmation of the good togetherness of his parents, he being the substantive one flesh of their nuptial one flesh. He also extends the parent's common act into a common work so that they can consolidate what Aquinas calls the greatest friendship of all, namely a partnership of the whole range of domestic activity, the raising of children, and the management of a household. As for the child, who is the embodiment of the common good of his parents, he too is not less the mother's if he is also the father's or vice versa. Their sharing together of the child does not diminish the share of each, since the child exists by virtue of their sharing together in the first place. The child is hers because he is also his and vice versa. The lack of diminishment and therefore competition between mine and thine obtains ultimately because of the fourth element. In the common good, the we is prior to the members in the sense that the members are defined by it. They are what they are because they are members. This is radically so when we come to be upon entering the human race through the family as members of it. 
we receive our very being, then sustenance, then education, when we are brought into membership of the community of life and love. In this sense, there can be in principle no competition between mine and thine, for it is by virtue of thee that I am me. Fifth, and finally, we note the fitting togetherness of the common good in the highest sense, involving members that, that is, that are complementary as opposed to homogeneous or inter and therefore interchangeable. This is because the common good being communicative generously generates not only distinct members in the numerical sense, with all of their integrity, etc., but also in the modal sense. Members, that is, who exist in distinct and correlative manners, modes, of being one and not the other, order to each other. In this way, they are not exchangeable in the manner of an instrumental good, which can be substituted by any other one or thing that can get the job done. In the common good of the highest sort, the members are brought together communally, together, by virtue of their complementary distinction or distinctness. This is evidently so with the man and the woman. Their distinctness is the condition of possibility for a distinct generation. In fact, the new child is completely distinct, genetically speaking, by virtue of being the fruit of distinct parents not the mere replication of one, a clone. That is why he is also distinct as a boy or a girl. The child then continues to hold the parents apart as much as he holds them together. By being their one flesh, substantively, he confirms and amplifies their distinctness. For now the woman is a mother and the man a father. Even more so in the exercise of raising children and running a household, which is particularly complex in the case of the human home, they must cooperate in distinct tasks, these being rooted both in the necessities of nature, strictly speaking, childbirth and nursing on the one hand, protection on the other, but also in the necessity of promoting the reciprocal state of dependency between the man and woman, which every culture has done, except ours. The mother and father also hold the next generation apart from them, to begin with, they did not make their child. The child came to be as unwanted, so to speak, in an act where no one was thinking about them. But other arrangements of law also hold the children apart from the parents. The taboo of incest protecting the child's distinct identity, such that he, while being totally dependent upon the parents, is not simply at their disposal like a drone slave, but centered in himself. Laws against abortion and infanticide, of course, also prevent the child from being simply a thing of the father or a thing of the mother. In short, as John Paul II says, the constitution of man and woman defines from the beginning the qualities of the common good of humanity. Sexual difference, that is, supplies us with an account of the common good of the highest sort, the goodness of being together in a unity and distinction, because by virtue of it, one is already always from, with, and for another. Gender, on the contrary, is the device that renders the good uncommon. It does this in the most radical way, by separating our existence from our birth, if not actually, at the least, from the evidence of it, what is now called biological sex. To be a boy or a girl is to see that we exist by being begotten and born and all before asking to be. To be a boy or a girl is at one and the same time to exist, since we came into existence by birth. That is why if one wanted to curse his existence, were it to become burdensome, as it usually is, he had to curse his birth and the evidence of it. Thus Job said, perish the day on which I was born, the night when they said, this child is a boy. But now that with gender, we can curse our birth and the evidence of it while staying alive. We can imagine existence free from difficulty because it is now emancipated from birth and from those without whom we cannot exist. We can now ask to be born, that is decide for ourselves who and what we are and will be. 
Essentially, we're dealing with a profound post-Christian nihilism that imagines we can return back to nothing and perform ourselves into existence. This is explicit in the thought of Judith Butler, who is quite conscious of translating Nietzsche's claim that, quote, there is no being behind doing, affecting, becoming. The deed is everything. The Italian political philosopher Agosto del Noce, much, comment, much quoted here, commented on the deeply nihilistic character of the sexual revolution, which understood itself to be the most comprehensive of all revolutions because it attacked the most repressive party, not only civili civilization and its values, but the very principle of reality itself. It was against sex fascism. This was the reason for the aversion to giving birth that so marked that revolution. But now gender would take us even further into the nothing, since we can now be averse to our own birth. We can have reality, our existence, our identity, without it being handed on to us by its principle. By separating ourselves from the reality of our birth, gender guarantees all the other separations in the sexual realm, the ones we have been working on for years sex from generation, man from woman, generation from sex. It makes the paradigmatic couple finally utterly dispensable to each other because it separates each of them from their actual sex, and we would say their actual selves. Now the evidence of their whole relativity is meaningless, merely biological, if not also invisible, what this means is that you can now be everything to yourself, wholly absolute, like Aristophanes' androgynous full circle without openings either outward or upward. You can not only love the one you love, but be the one you love, which is likely what is behind many of the phenomenon we are witnessing. The possibilities are many as we know, and we find no reason to keep updating ourselves. One can be neither asexual, like bacteria, both at the same time, like worms, both at different times, fluid, like clownfish. <laughs> or one thing on the inside, sex, and another on the outside, gender, or however you want to put it, like a bearded woman. In any, any event, whatever one is, that identity has nothing to do with what makes the sexes indispensable to each other. For now, to be a man is to have a beard, which may be very nice. Adrian, your beard is very nice. But it's not the beard that makes the man indispensable to a woman. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> as, as for the man with the beard, well, he may well be the one who was pregnant. So he doesn't need the woman either. In short, the relativity, in short, the relativity to what we are not has been abolished. This doesn't mean that one doesn't have relationships, but now that we have been emancipated from our bodies and all of the necessary relations inscribed in them, relationships are only ties we fabricate as we please, on the basis of will or feeling, and therefore on the basis of ourselves. We are now only proximate to ourselves, again, Manon. Over 30 years ago, Del Noce said that today's nihilism is no longer tragic. It is rather gay, in both the older bourgeois sense, because it suppresses the Augustinian restlessness with a sequence of superficial pleasures, but also in the newer sense because its symbol is homosexuality, even when it retains the man-woman relation. Gay nihilism, says Del Noce, is not seeing sexual difference as a sign of the other, it conceives love, therefore, as the pure prolongation of the I. Now with a new chapter of that same nihilism in full swing, Del Noce's assessment is all the more trenchant. The current gender represents a deeper and more comprehensive form of the prolongation of the I because of the level at which it suppresses the drama of the human heart, not just our orientation, but what we are. Gender would keep us from seeing sexual difference altogether by eliminating any residual evidence that there might still be a reality there other than our own wills. In short, there is no more dizzying paradox. It should be obvious that if we are not what we are because of our birth, children also will be, but not because of their birth. 
For if to be a man or a woman no longer rests on what makes them indispensable to each other, parents will no longer be indispensable for the children they will call theirs. Thus, the joint sexual act will be replaced by an exchange for other more effective means. Even sexual difference will be replaced by cloning or the coaxing of gametes out of stem cells. Children would be born to both sexes equally or independently of either, says the feminist Shulamite Firestone, who looked forward to this possibility as freedom for the child from the tyranny of being born. The tyranny of the biological family would be broken. Politically speaking, gender provides the new society with a cell and the new good it has been waiting for. That society, says Manon, has been fleeing the law for centuries since it decided to be no longer governed by an objective, rational, and therefore common rule and measure, the law of God and nature. Rather, it is governed by the rights and interests of a subject in infinite proximity to himself. He is together with others in a collective life, but only negatively in the sense of defended rights and assured interests, so long as they are not harmful to others. So here is the low sense of the common good, but which seems to me to really preclude the highest sense. That is, in the sense that the common uh, serves the individual's good precisely in setting, setting people apart so that they can be uncommon. In short, he, the citizen, is alone together, or they are alone together on safe contractual grounds, not on the grounds of nature, which is at war. But what about the first vital cell which generates that nature, the school of war, to paraphrase Mill? Gender is the solution. It's the ultimate safe sex. Because it destroys the old cell, our carnal bodies and all the bonds inscribed in them, and then it builds on the new safe ground. Forms of kinship can now be established on the grounds of choice alone, not to mention donors, surrogates, laboratories brought together by legal contracts and lots of money. Gender is the cell the new society has been waiting for because it installs the relation to self in an inviolable sovereignty by ensuring its reproduction in a petri dish. And now, as Manon says provocatively, everyone is an outlaw outside the law because he is fleeing the natural law in the strongest and most pregnant sense of the term, having freed himself from the condition of birth made possible by the sexes. And if he's free from the natural law in the most pregnant sense, is he not free from law in every sense? Is not society as such lawless? especially as concerns the common good. That's all in all. Coda. There are many reasons to ask how safe safe sex really is. It should be clear enough now that after the long project of fleeing the natural law in the strongest and most pregnant sense of the term, how much violence we have done to ourselves. We have made ourselves motherless, fatherless, childless, and loveless. But the violence is even greater now, now that we are busy canceling ourselves out by transitioning into something other than what we are, another gender, another species. Postmodern fluidity is now well known. One must remain in a constant state of amorphous non-identity, non-selves, so as not to be trapped in a relation of power, since to be something is to be in a relation, rightly so. But even if you believe, as current moderns do, in robust subjectivity and agency, like Nussbaum, for example, in order to be free, you must vigorously resist your given nature, beginning with excluding it from the get-go in the deliberately constructed state of nature. Precisely by virtue of the kind of self you fancy yourself to be, autonomous, unbound, you must oppose yourself. In any event, because there is a prior relation or because we are embedded in relations, we cannot be as we are. Notwithstanding the differences, the self-subversive result is the same. We must cancel ourselves out. As for children, the dystopian literature written almost 100 years ago foresaw what would befall them were they to be made, not begotten. One thinks of the fertilizing rooms in Brave New World where scores of identical individuals are produced through reproductive processes Typical processes, typical of the lowest forms of life, the budding of a single fertilized ova, and then decanted. Processes that were preferred by many in the century that would invent gender, Simone de Beauvoir, for example, John Money, is very interested in this possibility. 
One thing that they are not is unique individuals. The elimination of sexual difference has made them mere copies. Therefore, they are exchangeable, just as their mothers have been exchanged by machines. They are also devoid of any aspiration, desire, and restlessness for what lies beyond their station, beyond the roof. They form no genuine bonds of love. They hate to read. They don't look at or listen to anything beautiful. In short, they resemble the lowest forms of life stuck in place. And they are not free. Children who are not born or who are not, who are not what they are by virtue of birth are products of their conditioners, to quote both Brave New World and Lewis, be it the ones in the fertilizing rooms decanting them, be it the current ones in the surgical theaters dismembering them and sterilizing them. All of this deprivation of love, of individuality, of freedom, of restlessness go hand in hand with the deprivation of logos. Children who are not born or not what they are by virtue of birth cannot speak with their mother tongue, that common language, describing what both what gives birth, mother and father, and the evidence of it, boy and girl. As a result, they are deprived of the most basic contact with a common reality, the principle of reality, that intimate relation which with, with that which is not, re, re, that in intimate relation with which is not reducible to oneself, even and especially when it concerns one's very self, since one cannot exist without the other. That is why John Paul II said, so, so-called safe sex, which is touted by the civilization of technology, is actually in view of the overall requirements of the person, radically unsafe. Indeed, it is extremely dangerous. And what is the danger? It is the loss of the truth about oneself together with a risk of a loss of freedom and consequently of a loss of love itself. It's our task now to show that reality is fundamentally good, that it is worth being born. Thank you. Thank you.